Can't wait to ring the bell. All right. Um, while people trickle in, so I want to stress one thing right off the bat. This is a, a, a general lab safety seminar. Uh, this is not attendance, mandatory attendance of this does not preclude the requirement that anybody working in a controlled space get the special training that they would get in a controlled space. Okay. Um, so everybody is asked to come here that's, that's on this campus, and that's because we're all doing experimental science on this campus, and, and, and some of the stuff we do uh, potentially is hazardous. And, um, and the simple reality is, however, safety is the most important thing. There's nothing more important than that. There's no shortcuts that we can justify um, that put any one of us or our colleagues at risk. And um, we've been over the years improving uh, the way we handle this general safety. And we put together the seminar. I think this is the third time we've done it. Um, Tim would know. I think this is the third time, right? So last time we did it was 2014. Actually, you can see the tape, date stamps. So we, we, we've been struggling with, ideally, we do this once a year because we have an influx of people once a year. Um, however, we seem to be doing this at a frequency that's slightly slower than that. But it's still getting done. So I'm just going to jump into it. Looks like everybody's here in the room. Uh, this is mandatory, so the people who don't show up for this will have to watch this on the video and sign this. Um, the outline of this, this presentation is as follows. I'm going to give you general lab laboratory rules of safety. Um, to, I'll talk a little about compressed gases. Michelle will talk to you about our gas policy, uh, which is an essential part to maintaining safety with regards to compressed gases. Tim will talk about radiation laser safety. Steely will talk about biohazard safety. I'll talk a little bit about cryogen and fire safety. Paul Goldie will talk about electrical safety. And then if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Um, so I'll start out by saying, as a general thing, it's all good till it's seriously not good. And everybody was absolutely blown away when they had this disaster in a laboratory at UCLA where a very young scientist died. And she basically was burned over 20, over 50% of her body and 18 days later died in an ICU. Um, so absolutely horrible and completely avoidable. And as you see here, the last news is back in 2011 that felony charges were filed against the University of California and the UCLA uh, chemistry professor for, for essentially negligent manslaughter. So um, it, it's no joke. I mean, relatively routine things can go horribly wrong. Now, more recently, and this one really blew my mind, this was March 2016, uh, a young postdoc working in a lab unattended, and the apparatus she was working with blew up, and it tore her arm off. And she, she was very seriously injured, but she's alive. Um, but it just, it just blew my mind that such a thing could ever occur, um, and yet it did. And so as the story proceeds, now in April, they're saying they're linking this explosion to, to safety failings. That seems sort of obvious. Um, but where it gets critical is now we're into the he said, she said phase. So in this one article, basically, they point to fingers, and she's blaming her supervisor, the woman who got lost her arm, for a director in one way. And he's saying, oh, well, she, she built the thing. And she says, yeah, but you designed it. But the upshot, she says, in underline, she claimed that her supervisor, she'd been receiving static shocks when touching the air tank during the prior experiments. But he told, she said he told her not to worry about it. And this is the critical thing. We want you to worry about it. If something seems wrong, stop. So it's going to go for a long time who's to blame, who's not to blame. The reality is there's a young woman missing an arm now. And the bottom line is if you're an experimenter and you see a problem, you've got to stop. It doesn't matter what your supervisor says. Nobody's, there's no hierarchy when it comes to safety here. Uh, so just because somebody's above you in rank, does, you know, so-called rank, doesn't mean anything with regard to safety. Um, so you are the most important person responsible for your personal safety, right? And if you observe other people doing things in an unsafe manner, you are required, that is our policy, to inform them of that problem. If they continue, you bring up the issue with your supervisor or with the members of the safety committee, which uh, you can find on our website. And it's currently myself, Victor Strushkin, Alex Steele, Andrew Steele, Tim Strobel, Paul Goldie, and I forgot to take Kat Crispin off there. I knew I missed something. So not Kat. Um, so uh, all facilities on on uh, campus are, as I said, controlled areas. So this seminar is just a general lab safety. Uh, to work in any one specific laboratory, 
right? You have to have access granted by the person in charge of that laboratory. Every single laboratory has a person in charge. Um, and their specific safety requirement, safety training is required to work in that laboratory. So for everyone in the lab, make sure that you filled out the proper safety forms for the labs that you work in, and you have to consult with a PI in charge of that lab to get that training. And then for PIs, it's critical for you to know who's working in your labs and check forms and training they're up to date and update the lists of the users. And we're working on ways of making this a little bit more automated. So we started out purely paper and we'd like to do this better, but at least what we're doing is better than what we have. Um, everybody should, ever working with any chemical should study the material safety data sheets associated with that chemical. And it, I'll tell you, it, it saved me one time in a big way from the compound I did not think was nearly as re reactive as it turned out to be. Unfortunately, I, I followed my own rule and I read the MSDS and I'm like, oh, wow. Who knew? Um, but it was, it was clearly in there. It was a very, very reactive compound. Um, again, so, don't go backwards, sorry. So, now, you'll notice I have these, these numbers. These are safety, general safety rules. We give this to you when everybody comes. Michelle gives them a, a welcome packet, and these rules are, are in there. So, for one, if you have any concerns regarding the safety of a specific laboratory procedure, you're to stop immediately and ask questions. Um, don't just keep moving forward. That's how accidents happen. You have to stop immediately. And if safety concerns persist, then you, co you, you contact the GL Safety Committee. Um, similarly, we have very specific issues with chemical waste, and it must be stored properly in properly labeled containers. And then we'll have, well, ideally, an annual waste chemical waste pickup um, where we can get rid of them in the proper way. So, so th this has to be, this is, if, if you know, they, we could be, in essence, audited by the DOE or uh, other, because we do DOE label work, and they're very, very strict about that. Uh, all containers have to be labeled clearly. So even if you have a flask of water, it has to be labeled water, just because you say, oh, but that's just water. It's, it's, it's not hazardous at all. It doesn't matter because we don't know what it is. It's just a clear liquid. It could be anything. Um, so these are that. Um, obviously, never pour any chemicals into sinks or drains. Proper attire is required. That's from lab to lab. We'll have specific rules that will be in your special training. Uh, food and drink are not permitted in the laboratories. Now, I would argue that you know the person in charge of the laboratory, if they feel that it's okay for you to bring in a cup of coffee, that would be their dis discretions. But in general, presume that the answer is no. Um, report all accidents and near accidents to safety committee. We can't fix what we don't know is broken. Um, you should always check specific laboratory procedures regarding working alone in the laboratory after normal business hours. The woman who, who uh, caught on fire doing a, a very straightforward chemical procedure using a very reactive compound was working by herself on a weekend during a holiday break. So when she caught herself on fire, there was nobody there that could have helped her. Um, and, and she might have survived if she had had a buddy or somebody looking in after her, but uh, she didn't. And so that, there were so many problems with that accident, one compounding the other. And do understand emergency procedures and know where to find emergency contact information for each controlled space. So you're going to go you walk around the building and see these safety diamonds. All laboratories have these safety diamonds as mandatory outside. And what they mean is you've got basically blue is health hazard, red is flammability, yellow is reactivity, and white is special. So for example, here, that cross to the W means no water. And You've got moderate health, but you've got extreme flammability. So it's zero to four and fairly high uh, reactivity. So li basically liquid nitrogen has no reactivity, but, but TNT is obviously very high reactivity. So the bottom line is all of them have them, and you should, you should be aware of this, and you should look at them. Um, you may also find a bunch of other hazard signs. And the bottom line is if you don't understand what the hazard sign is, you shouldn't enter that room. I mean, they're up there for a reason. And so we're saying, if you see a safety sign, read it and respond to it. If you do not understand it, stop and go ask somebody what, what it means, right? And some of these are pretty obscure, but uh, you know, nevertheless, they're there. So if you park by the magnet, the NMR lab, you'll see danger, gigantic magnetic field. Well, you should be cognizant that that's telling you something for a good reason. Okay, so compressed gas cylinders. And we were thinking about the last two serious safety issues we've had at GL involve compressed gases, and I think it's probably the area of one of our greatest risks. So the first was a lack of a proper uh, pressure regulator that resulted in an explosion, 
and a, a, a very scary visit to an emergency room with loss of blood, but fortunately no loss of eyes, by pure luck, as far as I could tell. And it was entirely because proper pressure regulator was not being used. And the other was the improper release of silane gas to atmosphere, which resulted in an explosion, obviously, and a potential risk of, of injury and or death. Um, so both of these are, were in complete violation of our general laboratory safety. So it's just, it, you know, the, oh, the last one you just saw I said around is that somebody left unsecured gas tanks just sitting there in the, in the, in the uh, loading dock, which is also a violation of our safety policy. So that could also have severe consequences. Uh, there's too much more information. I'm not going to do it. I simply say there's a lot of information you should think about. You talk to Michelle. Michelle will have copies of all of this. The bottom line is you, you, you got to know what you're working with. The plan accordingly. I'm going to skip through this. I'll say a dropped gas cylinder, potentially deadly. And if the valve stem is not secured by a cap, and you break that, and you snap the valve stem in a 3,500 psi helium tank, that thing's going to take off like a missile. And it weighs, what, like 120 pounds or something. So it, it it's, could be absolutely catastrophic. So if, if I see somebody moving through the tank with, with a cap not on the valve stem, that's a complete violation of safety and common sense. Again, correct regulator is, is critical. You have to use it. If you don't have one, talk to us. We'll buy you one. Right? It, it's just no excuse not to do that. Um, lots more information. It's, I guess the bottom line is that the greatest physical hazard by compressed gases is the just tremendous force that can be released if they're knocked over. And, and uh, you, you just can't imagine. So I'm going to hand it over to Michelle, and she's going to talk about a cylinder policy. OK, so we tried to make the ordering and return process easier for everybody. So you can just go through me. So basically, you can send a PO to Tron. And if you are unsure of the price of a gas or what you need, you can ask me. I can help. Um, you're also welcome to call Air Gas or Roberts and find out the price if you want. But if you don't have time, I'm happy to do that for you. We have account reps that I work with every day. Um, so then Trong, after the PO is uh, okayed by your supervisor and Trong, he'll send it to me. I order it. Um, I keep track of the gas cylinder. Then I'll label it for you either in the flammable or non-flammable area, let you know when it gets here, and then you can go pick it up. Uh, same thing for empty tanks. If you can all just please remember to take a picture with your smartphone when you put a tank downstairs or just, you know, write it down, the PO number, that's all I need, and then we'll get it returned the next day. Otherwise, they just sit there and we have to pay money for the rental. Um, and if you go downstairs and you aren't sure how to secure the cylinder, just ask me, I'll find somebody to help you. Um, I know I can't do it either, so I realize it's tough, <laughs> but we have to make sure they're all secure. Um, so yeah, if you need help, just let me know, but please let me know when you put a tank downstairs if it's empty. And if there's a problem with the cylinder, we can have it um, replaced in a day. So just let me know and we'll get that replaced. But also, if you borrow a tank from somebody, please let me know because that's one way we lose track of cylinders. I found a cylinder like underneath a cabinet one time. So when we have audits, we need to know where all the tanks are. So if you aren't using a tank anymore, please let me know. We'll get it returned and don't hide them under cabinets. Thanks. Oh, there's another slide. So this is not accurate, but um, the cylinder storage is in the loading dock, the non-flammable and return cylinders. If you don't know where that is, let me know. I'll be happy to show you. And then the flammable tank is stored outside, and the key is hanging on the little key hook right inside the loading dock by the clipboards. Um, there are a lot of flammable tanks in that cage right now, so if you're not using them, please take a look and let me know so we can get them returned. I use this one. Okay, um, Tim is next, and I'm going to give him a different. Uh, you can use this this one if you want, or if you, you wash go. your hands afterwards. Um, the, I'll just reiterate what Michelle said too. Don't we don't want to accumulate tanks? So if you're not using a tank for say a period of, you have to use it the next month or two, mm -hmm. and it's and it's not particularly expensive, right? Let's just return it. You know, we we actually can't. It adds up. Yeah, that as if we're not allowed to store as much compressed gas sometimes as we have in this building by law. 
All right. Uh, thank you, George. So, this is a general overview for hazards of the electromagnetic spectrum. As George mentioned before, uh, this does not dismiss you from the specific laboratory training that you need to have for any lab that you're working in that uses some form of radiation. Um, so first, let's start with uh, X-rays, and actually, you know, different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum can present different hazards. Uh, microwaves, for example, if you have a pacemaker, could be dangerous. Um, visible radiation comes with its own hazards: ultraviolet, infrared. Um, the distinction here about X-rays is that X-rays are actually an ionizing form of radiation. So this means they can actually knock an electron outside of an atom. Uh, and then create all sorts of havoc in a biological system. Uh, so one interesting uh, tidbit is that you can't sense um, when you're exposed to x-rays. You, you, you don't actually feel it. Uh, sometimes people report a tingling sensation if they've been exposed to an x-ray beam, but this is actually the air being ionized on top of your skin. Um, but nevertheless, you can have severe uh, radiation burns. Um, all of the x-ray equipment at the geophysical laboratory has uh, proper shielding, and we monitor the x-ray radiation uh, monthly. Um, so uh, everything should, should be protected, but nevertheless, you should realize this hazard. Um, there are three areas right now that have potential risks for ionizing radiation. One is the x-ray crystallography laboratory, which is on the first floor of the research building when you walk in from the entrance closest to the Abelson building, uh, room 108. And there are currently three X-ray diffractometers in there. Um, two that use copper, uh, K-alpha radiation, one molybdenum. Um, there, there's a, also a Moss Bauer spectroscopy lab. The hazard there is gamma rays. Um, this is uh, the room on the ground, uh, ground floor of the research building across from the mail room. And I'll let you know that we're actually disassembling uh, the Moss Bauer spectroscopy lab and sending back all the radioactive sources right now. Uh, so that will no longer present a, a hazard in the future. And then there's one other uh, X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, which is upstairs. Um, we believe it's room 222, the hydrothermal laboratory. Um, Dionysus Vastukos is, uh, in, uh, in, for all intents and purposes, in charge of that space. Um, so anytime you see one of these signs here, like the, the radiation trefoil or this uh, ionizing radiation sign, I believe this is the only symbol that we have on our campus, you should be aware that there is a potential for ionizing radiation in the room. Um, there are certain dose limits that are regulated. Um, for example, we, we use these units, um, REMS, um, your whole body, the, the dose limit for the regulatory statutes in the District of Columbia. Uh, you can have five REMS uh, annually for your whole body or 50 just on your um, skin, hands and arms. Uh, we monitor this and actually, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, on the next slide, uh, we never uh, see these, these doses of radiation uh, in, in any of our laboratories, but you know, the instruments that we do have could, could greatly exceed this. Uh, a direct beam, like an x-ray beam, you could get uh, 400,000 rems per minute, for example. Um, so again, just to reiterate, all these laboratories are controlled spaces. You must have the proper training to work in these laboratories. Uh, and we work with a policy, this is more specific to the users in these laboratories, called ALARA, which is as low as reasonably achievable. Um, so basically, we're, we're taking action to make sure that your potential exposure is as low as possible. Um, but it, it comes back to the first thing, uh, the point that George made in our um, list, is that you should know all these hazards. You're the one uh, most responsible for your own safety. So um, due to the monitoring over the past three years and all the, the radiation reports that come back monthly. Uh, we no longer require you to wear dosimetry badges in these laboratories, but they're optional if you'd like to wear one. Uh, if you're working in a laboratory, please just talk to me. Uh, and again, work, working under this principle of, of as low as reasonably achievable, we decrease the time we're in these laboratories, increase the distance away from a source, and increase the shielding. We have modern shielding on all of our instrumentation. Uh, never tamper with uh, the mechanisms or safety interlocks in any of these machines. And um, one other point, if you are pregnant, um, you must declare your pregnancy because those dosage um, regulations are a little bit different for pregnant women. So please declare that um, if you're going to be working with radiation and, and uh, let us know and we'll, we'll work with you on that. Okay, so lasers. This is a famous slide from Riney. Don't look into the laser beam with your remaining eye. Um, 
Again, controlled space here. If you see this symbol here, um, this means that there's going to be a laser in the laboratory. Um, and you, you're not to go into these laboratories without specific training um, or unless you're guided by the qualified personnel of that laboratory. So there are several different hazards associated with uh, visible or uh, invisible radiation now in the, in the lasers we're talking about. So we don't, I don't have a, I do have a laser pointer here. Um, so we have small lasers like this. These are class one lasers. Um, actually, let me just put the classes up here. Um, we have various uh, UV infrared lasers, visible lasers with different classes, um, including uh, all the way up um, to the highest class lasers where we definitely have to wear uh, eyewear. Uh, there are, so it's important to know exactly what you're working with and what's in the laboratory. Um, there are different hazards uh, associated with the different types of radiation. So for example, um, if you're working with uh, ultraviolet light, there, there are some eczema lasers on campus as well. Um, you can have damage that would be similar to like a sunburn. Uh, if you're working with uh, infrared radiation, uh, you can have serious damage to your cornea. Um, these are potentially very hazardous because they're invisible. Uh, you can't see them. Uh, so for example, if you just have this diffuse lamp light source here, uh, you can look at this irradiation at the back of your eye, something like 150 watts per meter squared. If you have a point source, like a laser pointer right into the eye, this could be something like 300 million watts per meter squared. Um, so when you're working in these laboratories, it's very important to understand um, what, eye, what protective eyewear you should wear. And consult with your PI in the specific laboratory you're working in. Um, but there are different symbols when you look on your glasses you should be aware of and make sure that you're, you're using the right type of eye protection. So here there's uh, different letters, D, I, R, M, that refers to different type of uh, lasers. So there's a continuous wave laser, which essentially gives a continuous output of power over time. There's different types of pulse lasers that give different um, pulse sequences over uh, time for lasers. So something um, that we look at here, I think LB is a European version. Uh, op optical density, um, basically a logarithmic scale of how many times you're going to reduce the intensity of light. Um, so, you know, uh, OD3 means you'll reduce this by a factor of 1,000. So if you see something like this on your glasses, um, DIR 1,000, 1,300, LB, or OD5, usually we see in the States, uh, this would have uh, optical density 5 protection for a D, I, and R type of beam across the wavelength range of 1,000 to 1,300 nanometers in the near infrared. Um, so very important to realize the types of glasses. And if you do have a concern, uh, if you're working in a laboratory and you, you don't feel like you have the proper eye protection that you need, just talk to us and we'll get you set up. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Steely to talk about biohazards. This is my part of my being part of the safety committee. Uh, so, are we using this? Sure, go yeah, for it. it. If there's one thing you take away from this, it's the bright colours. I'm using a, a biological uh, mechanism to scare you away from the bio. <laughs> right. So, for those working in biology, um, basically, bio, the biohazard level that I have in my lab is biohazard, biohazard safety level one. There is no pathogens or uh, anything that can seriously kind of infect you and kill you. Although at Vera, I will tell you the story of the uh, of anthrax if anyone wants to hear it. Um, so most of the stuff that we have is non-pathogenic. However, any bacteria in the wrong place will cause you a problem, right? Uh, if you have a cut, something gets in there, blah, blah, blah. Um, or if you spill or drink. <coughs> Uh, or whatever, it, it can be, have serious um, serious repercussions. Most of the stuff we have, uh, you, you know, you have to wear gloves, you have to wear um, uh, lab coats, um, wash your hands. Uh, we have uh, decontamination procedures for the laboratory, which include autoclaving, which will sterilize everything, and then going for burning. The people most at risk here, apart from the people, the scientists in the lab, are obviously the cleaning staff, and they're under instructions not to take anything with a biohazard symbol on it. 
into trash. Right? And we burn the stuff, it's a, it's a belt and braces approach, as they say, where I come from. We don't need to do it, but we do. Um, so the lab is covered by public health concerns and public uh, health issues, and more than any other lab in this uh, building, just because of the biology and the, we can't work with human tissue, for instance. So do not enter the lab unless invited. Always wear a lab coat in the lab. Uh, the lab coats I have are special, so if you spill anything, you can't get up your arms or anything like that. It'll wick it out. It's it's quite uh, peculiar to working in biohazards environments. If you become contaminate, uh, contaminated, uh, wash your hands. Don't borrow glassware from my lab, please, because you don't know what's been in it. It'll come and get you. Do not work in lab unless uh, you've taken the safety course with me and adhere to posted safety rules. Definitely no eating or drinking in the bio labs themselves. Do not use cultures elsewhere without instigating the correct safety procedures. Talk to me. So if you're taking cultures out the lab to use, talk to me first so I can make sure that uh, if there's any issues, you know where the lab spill uh, safety kits are, spill kits, etc. Lab coat, gloves, safety specs if necessary, massive masks if necessary. Well, that's usually to prevent you breathing on the sample but most of the stuff that I do are in laminar safety hoods and the reason I use those is because they're all class 2 hoods I'm at biosafety level 1 so I'm just being extra safe so if you have to work with stuff outside of the laminar flow cap come and see me about it all bacteria viruses etc are dangerous concentrated and growing in the wrong place you have a cut and you get some bacteria on the way, it doesn't matter what the species is, they'll go, they'll go to town. Okay? Uh, report cuts immediately, report spills and use spill kits immediately, use red autoclave bags and phlebotomy boxes for contaminated materials, and these are the things, cleaners, that you should not pick up. Okay? Anything in the normal bins is fine, anything else marked with that symbol, don't touch. We'll take care of that. That's our, that's our Thanks. So, uh, cryogen fire safety. Um, it turns out, so we, we have a large tank of liquid nitrogen. So many of us use liquid nitrogen. Uh, some are more familiar with it. Some of us use it every day. Some of us use it very rarely. Um, we've had a number of incidents in the past where people were told, oh yeah, you can go down to the main tank and get your liquid nitrogen there. Uh, but there was no evidence that they had been trained on how to handle liquid nitrogen or they'd ever seen it before. Uh, the obvious thing about liquid nitrogen is, is it's extremely cold, right? So it's minus, almost minus 200 C, and it will give you severe frostbite. And I'll tell you right off the bat, the burns that you get, the frost burns that you get from liquid nitrogen, are turns out are much worse than the equivalent thermal burn you would get from putting your hand in the fire. And the rationale for that, I'm not quite sure, but I've been told that the the human body evolved to have to deal with fire, and so the body evolved to learn how to deal with burns thermal burns. So there's a physiology, a physiological response to dealing with a burn injury. There is no such thing for, for liquid nitrogen burns. And so they it almost inevitably become horribly infected. They take forever to heal and, and they can lead to gangrene and other bunch of things. So, so it's no joke. It's not just that it'll freeze you. It, 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 it'll burn you in a really nasty way. Um, the other obviously thing is asphyxiation. Right? So the, the delta V from the liquid state to the gas state is huge. And if you're moving a doer of liquid nitrogen around, for example, on an elevator and it's venting very rapidly, you could asphyxiate yourself. And you'll have absolutely no warning because there's no sense in your body that can tell you that the oxygen levels are dropping relative to nitrogen. Um, explosion hazard is, is critical. This is, is really deadly. And there have been some, I'll show you two examples. And then the strangest one that nobody normally thinks about is, is, is potential fire hazard. And what's going on there is if you have an open doer liquid nitrogen and you're using it all day and you just keep filling it with liquid nitrogen as it boils off and you just keep doing this and doing this and doing this, what's happening is you're sucking oxygen into the liquid nitrogen. And eventually liquid nitrogen will basically boil off and what you'll be left with is very enriched, pure oxygen. And so if, if there's any possibility of an accelerant basically creating a fire situation, that can happen. And there have been some significant fires related to this. So the bottom line, I want just everybody to know, and, and to never ever ask somebody to do this, never ever fill a liquid nitrogen from the main tank using a transfer line if you have been specifically trained to do this. This is this is classic situation that leads to an explosion and death. And, and 
This, this has unfortunately happened a number of times. And so this is just a picture of somebody putting liquid nitrogen in a watermelon, which I don't recommend, but it makes for a spectacular explosion. Um, but there, here's a picture that's a little bit more chilling at a laboratory at Texas A&M, where a doer um, got the uh, safety vent failed on a doer, or somebody modified it, so the pressure built up, and over the weekend, fortunately nobody was there, the doer blew up. And apparently the story is the doer actually blew up through the ceiling, concrete reinforced ceiling, and ended up in the laboratory above, and blew out absolutely everything in this lab. It was otherwise a beautiful lab, but that's what's all that's left of the lab. Okay, so emergency evacuation plan. Um, Bottom line is, if you hear a fire alarm, see flashing lights, you have to immediately stop what you're doing and calmly but quickly leave the building through the nearest exit. If you see anybody else, tell them they've got to exit the building too. We had an issue where we didn't do this and we almost got shut down by the fire department. So this is, this is no joke. Um, what we want to do is rendezvous to the center of the campus, the grassy knoll. And then we should take an accounting for ourselves. And if, if somebody says, you know, I think I saw Ron in, in his office, you know, but he had his headphones on, so he couldn't hear the alarm, you know, so go maybe check, call him up, see if he's there. Um, so check around, keep people. And even if the alarm turns off, do not leave the build, enter the building until the fire department or the BBR staff give you all clear. Um, this could be really confusing, and this is, this is the rule, so it's not confusing anymore. Until somebody says, their authority is all clear, even if the alarm is off, don't go in. Go down to the lucky bar or do something else. Uh, fire prevention and awareness this is pretty obvious, but by, paper, flammable liquids, compressed gases, and electrical, all of these categories. Um, you should always know where the nearest fire extinguisher is located, and you should also know what type it is. Now, we've upgraded all our fire extinguishers to be multi-purpose. We used to have only water fire extinguishers, which was not a good idea. In principle, all fire extinguishers that you will find in a lab are the multi-purpose, put out any fire. However, you should verify that because we did have a lot of water fire extinguishers around. I can't tell you that in every lab there isn't one maybe still stuck in the corner. Uh, you should know where fire alarm boxes are. You should know what a fire blanket is and how to use it. I know this is special lab training. I train this for people in my lab. And again, a safety shower, if you have one, how to use it. But that's what we'll train you. Um, in the event of a fire, help anybody who's on fire, so the standard stop, drop, and roll. Fire blankets are for the safety showers. That woman in UCLA, had she been trained to use a fire blanket, could have put herself out immediately like that and, and not succumbed to, to, to the burns that she received ultimately. Apparently, she, when she caught on fire, she panicked and ran down the hallway. You know, I don't know what she was doing, but that's a standard response, apparently, when people catch on fire, they start to run, which is the worst possible thing you could do. Um, with regards to a fire in the lab, fight, the idea is fight or flee. Um, Basically, if you have a small contained non-toxic fire with clear egress and you have a proper fire extinguisher at hand, use it. Um, but if any doubt, you know, pull the alarm and go. And if you evacuate a space, close the doors behind you. Don't lock them, but close them so that you can at least reduce the airflow and, and uh, that. And now I'm going to hand off to Paul. It's electrical safety. I'm involved in maintenance and repair and fabrication of various um, electrical subsystems and two labs in particular that have high power, even high voltage um, uh, supplies. It's a directional mic, so you gotta point that. Um, the multi anvil lab and uh, the laser labs, and we've successfully repaired. Uh, high voltage laser supplies in house without having to send them out uh, for a price and we do have to remember that laser users <clears throat> that's high voltage and those filter capacitors they like to hold a charge a long time so make sure you discharge those capacitors before you put your hands inside the chassis. The multi anvil lab we have very high current power transformers uh, for those five separate experiments and that's ongoing maintenance with those power transformers. We're talking hundreds hundreds of amperes like an arc welder supply and uh, that's an open lab but uh, most of the power junctions and connections are uh, well shielded with plastic. You can see the junctions but you can't you can't touch them. Uh, everybody has a uh, natural uh, respect and maybe fear of 
power that comes out of the wall, the mains uh, power that we have access to that we can plug in our coffee pots and whatnot. Uh, in certain circumstances, that can be lethal if you're standing in a puddle of water. Um, I've been electrocuted many times, not with my current employer, but other employers. And it's not a pleasant feeling. Um, uh, if you have an issue in your lab with a tattered cord or a finicky power supply, uh, I'm your first contact. And uh, if we can fix it in-house, we'll do that. Uh, we've had uh, recent issues with tripping circuit breakers. And uh, I don't know how old a research building is, but uh, circuit breakers do get old. And uh, after I um, can't do anything, I contact the BPR people with a work order. And we've had a few circuit breakers replaced. and. We carry on with our research, but uh, electrical safety is more of a common sense thing. You don't stick things in a wall outlet. You don't stick wires in a wall outlet. You use a proper connector. But um, if you have any electrical issues, um, your first contact, and uh, we'll carry on with our research safely. Safely. All right. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, and I definitely do want to stress is that, um, it, you know, it's such a simple thing to replace an old cable and some of the cables in there, things are, these are old cracked things, you know. Um, and certainly if you ever feel, here's an example, I was in the hydrothermal lab and I was talking to a postdoc and I saw one of the furnaces um, had some little ceramic bits in, in the uh, coil, the coils that heat the furnace. And so I was just, had a pair of, uh, tweezers and I'm kind of pulling them out while I'm talking to him and all of a sudden I went but <laughs> and he looked at me and he said do you just electrocute yourself and I said yeah but I don't know how I could do this because the furnace is off and so I went to talk to Chris Hadiakos and he told me I was insane but that's impossible because the furnace is off but I said no I, I definitely did he went up and measured it and he was like holy cow the thing had been wired and correct it was floating off ground by a lot it was totally hot, even when the power switch was off, right, which is really scary. So, so if, you have, if that ever happens, you bring it to Paul's attention immediately, because sometimes people make mistakes. And in this case, the person who put the thing together did not wire the thing correctly at all. So that's everything we want to talk to you about. Um, if, if any of the other people safety committee, if I've failed to, to say anything, again, to reiterate, yes? the first floor and uh, we have a special box where cardboard extra empty cardboard boxes uh, are thrown before they're taken out for recycling and I happened to notice uh, a clear four liter bottle which was empty except for a little bit of liquid in the bottom uh, and it was labeled hydrochloric acid so evidently the cleaning folks were going to put this out with the rest of the class and I uh, used the, the litmus test on the one or so milliliters of liquid in the bottom and uh, it was zero. So that was uh, hydrochloric acid in the bottom of that bottle. And I brought this to the safety committee's attention. Um, uh, chemical bottles should be rinsed out at least three times. Um, I don't, I, we didn't follow through on this on who was the owner of that particular bottle, but uh, uh, you shouldn't see chemical bottles in the in the trash bin, and the cleaning staff should be made aware that uh, just because there's a clear liquid in the bottom of a bottle, it, it won't necessarily be water. Yeah, I have to. That's that's a very good point, um, and that's the responsibility of the people who control the lab space. It's not the it's it's not the responsibility of anybody with BBR to have to guess what they find in a bottle somewhere. And in fact, that's a very serious offense. So the standard rule of thumb is you either dilute it till you can pour it down a sink, and, and legally that's completely correct. If you can, EPA says if you can dilute benzene down to the EPA limit in water, you can pour it down the sink. Of course, it would take Olympic swimming pools to do that, but so it'll never happen, right? Um, but the bottom line is we have, my lab has very specific procedures about how to get rid of old glassware. And, you know, we enter, we wash them, and then I scrape the label off, you know. That's before you discard it. That's how you do it. 
Um, but here, in a general sense of laboratory safety, if any of you had been walking down the hall and you saw a strange looking bottle with some liquid in it, that's, that's not right, right? That should be a red flag right there. And you should come to either the safety committee or the person you think who left it there and say, what's going on here? Because it's not appropriate to, to nothing in a laboratory should be sitting out in the hallway. So that's all I would say. Uh, does anybody have any comments? Oh, sure. Um, I just want to re-emphasize something that George talked about earlier on, but is really, really important. Safety comes from a sense of community. It means we're all in this together. If you see something that you don't agree with or you're worried about, you stop. If someone asks you to do something that you're worried about, you stop. No one will criticize you. No one will have a go at you. You go and see the people who are concerned, your PI or the safety committee to report things. If you see something you're not happy with, you have a word with the person and you report it. If you see a bottle in the hallway, it then becomes your responsibility to do something about it. Don't walk past it thinking someone else will do something. You do it, it's your responsibility. Develop a sense of community. You're looking after each other and yourselves. And each one of you is responsible for their role in making sure everyone is safe here. We can only give you guidelines to work from. You must internalize and own these guidelines and you must be the ones responsible. Does that make sense? And never, ever worry about saying stop or reporting something that you think is dangerous. Ever. There will be no repercussions. Okay? Yeah, well said. I would also, um, I'd also reiterate. There have been a couple times where I've seen tanks on carts. We have carts that, that recline and make it easier to move a tank. And, and it's perfectly fine if, if you're moving this along, you know, and, but you, that you don't, I've seen them just sitting in the hallway like this for days. Yeah, they're not storage. And, and, and if you see that, and God forbid if you ever see anybody moving a tank without the valve stem thing, call them on it. And I've seen people do this, and, and I'm just like, that is a complete violation. And it's, it's just a stupid thing to do. If you can't find a cap, come to us, we'll get you a cap. Um, this, there's no excuse. Okay, Bob? I was wondering if we had any restrictions on working on radioactive minerals, uranium minerals, for example. Not, I think natural abundance uranium is not an issue. Um, if for some reason, you happen to have a radioactive mineral from perhaps a highly radioactive that, that formed from a radioactively contaminated site. That's an interesting question. We're, we're the NRC. We're going to probably not because I'll tell you we're giving up our last little bit of our NRC license to have uh, cobalt fifty seven, and we're we're shutting the whole thing down. Uh, we were called being violation of of them, and it's just too much of a hassle for them, too much of a hassle for us. So so we're going to be pretty much off their well, their expectation is we have nothing that's not naturally radioactive here. That's what I would say. Any other questions, comments? Well, then I will say thank you. Turns on. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I just this is the most important thing we have to think about. It's the most. If the only thing that can really put Carnegie and GL in particular in jeopardy is if somebody screws up and there's a serious accident, a serious injury. And the simple reality is, is that if, if we screw up, P Street will just firewall us from the institution, they'll shut us down, and they'll lock the doors. That's what I would do if I was P Street. So it's critical that we don't. I just want to add one thing that we forgot to mention. Um, some of the labs we're doing uh, machining, and we make our own parts. We're working with lathes. Um, really take care to get the training that uh, you need to work on this equipment from the supervisor. Uh, particularly with the lathes, um, you know, if you happen to have long hair, um, you're you're putting your hair back so it can't get tangled and spin up in the lathe. If you're working with uh, some abrasive materials that you might ingest, make sure you're wearing the proper respirators and equipment and protective safety equipment. Yeah, thanks, Tim. That that's really critical. In fact, we want to take it one step further with regards to the lathe. Um, so Steve Hodges told me when he worked at Beretta, there were a lot of uh, biker types, you know, motorcycle gang guys, and they all had ponytails, and it was at Beretta, if you had a ponytail, you'd have to wear a hairnet. 
And because even if you have a ponytail, it doesn't mean if you turn your head over here, you can't get your hair caught. And the best case scenario that can happen if you get your hair caught in a lathe is you're scalped. Worst case scenario is you're dead, which is what happened to a woman at Yale, um, which was horrible. And she had her hair in a ponytail, so that wasn't sufficient. And so I really think that we're, I've talked to Faye about this, because Faye's got a, an open space. Of course, nobody, I, I think, is really at this too. Uh, if you don't know this, I'm telling you right now, under no set of circumstances is anybody in this laboratory should ever be working on any machines in the machine shop. That is absolutely illegal. It's, it's, it's just not. However, we do have two lathes that are available for people, and you can be trained to use them. Okay, but, but we're going to institute, I don't know where I'm going to find hair nuts, but we will buy them from somewhere. And we'll put them in that lab, and we expect people to use them. You also need to worry about your, your sweatshirts. Sweatshirts have um, like little things that come down. Those are just as dangerous as having long hair. So just because you have short hair doesn't mean... Sorry, the pull strings. Yeah, the yeah, pull, the pull that's strings a, can also get caught. Anything like that. It, it happens... <laughs> I won't take too much of your time, but I'll simply tell you, one time when I was in graduate school, we had this big uh, polishing lapse, and they have big electric motors, and we were using water to polish things. And so um, when we were done, we had to dry these big wheels off. And so I thought the clever thing for me was I would take a towel, and I would just turn on the polishing wheel and hold the towel there, and it would dry the surface. And of course, most of the time, it worked just fine. But one day, randomly, part of the towel wrapped around one part of the rotating thing, and another part of the towel wrapped around for something else. And in, in like just a second, that thing was bound and it just ripped the plate right off of there, which would have had it hit me, would have done some fear of injury. And it scared the living daylights out of me. And I never ever did that again. So I mean, it's like, it, that's what these, it just goes from everything's fine to everything's colossally bad in a nanosecond. It's, I can't emphasize it enough. All done? Thank you.